everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my Booktubeathon 2016 wrap up. This is my second time doing Booktubeathon and once again I have completed all seven of the reading challenges, so this is what I read. For two of the books that I read for three of the challenges, I'm going to be doing separate review videos, so I'm only going to briefly mention them here. I read Who Fears Death by Nettie Okorafor for the challenges of read a book with yellow on the cover and read a book by your favorite author. I didn't like this book very much, but I am glad that I read it. And my favorite book of the entire readathon was Arcadia by Ian Piers, which I read for the challenge of uh, a book that you discovered through BookTube. I first heard about this on Jen Campbell's channel. She did a video called Falling in Love with a Book, and that clued me into the existence of Arcadia, but I honestly didn't think about reading it until I saw it on the Clark Award shortlist for this year. I wish I picked it up sooner because it was really that good. I read Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus for two of the challenges, uh, read a book only after sunset and read a book that is older than you. This is not one of my favorite plays by Shakespeare, just for the sheer level of violence and horrible behavior in it. The escalating violence had me saying enough is enough by the end of the first act and there are five acts. It is also, I think, one of his earlier plays. I think it's supposed to be one of his earliest tragedies, and I don't think that the characters, their motivations, the story, or the language is as good as other plays that I've read by him. It is also difficult to summarize, but essentially, a Roman general named Titus Andronicus gets locked into a cycle of revenge between his family and Tamara, the queen of the Goths, and her two sons, and they're just trying to kill each other and do horrible things to each other. And a large part of this is that Tamara's sons rape and then mutilate uh, Titus's daughter Lavinia. I don't have much more to say about this play here, but I did actually notice, out of the blue, a connection between Titus Andronicus and another book that I read for Booktubeathon called The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. Basically, the idea of gene-centered evolution and how that should drive individual behavior and also strategies for solving or attacking iterated prisoners' dilemma um, can be seen in this play. I'm not going to go into that here, but I wrote an entire blog post about it, so if you want to know my thoughts on that rather unlikely connection between those two things, I will put the link down below. For read a book and watch its movie adaptation, I read Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, and I enjoyed this. I really I blazed through it very quickly, uh, but as I mentioned in my previous part one of this wrap-up, Prisoner of Azkaban is still, so far, my favorite uh, Harry Potter book in my reread. A thing that I really noticed when I read the book and then watched the movie is that a lot of my enjoyment, a lot of the interesting stuff, and what makes a lot of the revelations in the book so surprising are the subplots and extra characters in here that were actually cut out of the movie. And that was really disappointing. I think the movie was better than the first two movies, definitely, because the first two movies weren't that great. <laughs> but by removing so much of the subplots and those other characters, a lot of the depth of the story was completely lost for me. So while it's a quite a long book, um, I didn't feel like it was bloated, whereas I know that I think it's Order of the Phoenix that's like really long and I think it didn't need to be that long. I have definite opinions on the three main characters now. Harry is a really ordinary kid. He's a totally average wizard, basically, but he is a jock. <laughs> He's really good at Quidditch. That's his main strength and it is a sport. And I, I feel really bad for him now that he is quite ordinary and everyone treats him like he has exceptional powers, and he doesn't. He's just quite good. He's adapted to dealing with all the crap being thrown at him. And I get really irritated at how little emotional support he gets from adults. Like, when Mrs. Weasley finally hugs him, and he has that moment of a feeling of maternal love, 
I was really, really sad because it should not have taken four books and four years for that to happen. He needed it a lot before. I also don't care for Ron that much. I think he's a total wet blanket and Hermione is awesome. The final challenge was to read seven books and I had to read three extra things to meet this. First is Lazarus Volume 3 Conclave by Greg Rucka. I continue to really love this comic series and I'm just impressed at how quickly the story is progressing, how much character development and depth has already been introduced. Uh, the character of Forever has just been handled so well and it was really nice to see her already acting on the information she has about how she may not be related to the family that she thinks she was related to. She's going out and making some of her own decisions and potentially disobeying orders now and I really can't wait for volume four. Then I read The Arrival by Sean Tan. This is a children's graphic novel that's told entirely in pictures with no words. The artwork is really beautiful. It's all like sepia toned. It's a very limited color palette, but it is so imaginative and fantastical. I think a lot of the point of the artwork in this is to uh, never really evoke real human cultures or societies. This is not an immigration story of a man like going to Ellis Island. It does, it is reminiscent enough of a standard immigration tale and things like Ellis Island and, and going to a, a country and not having the money and not knowing the language and not being able to, to read things and even thinking that the architecture is weird without ever showing a real place. So it looks like a fantasy world and that was really cool. That technique worked so well at conveying that feeling of being lost in a, in a foreign world where you don't understand how anything works or what people are saying to you. So it was beautiful. It's a pretty simple story. It was quite emotional. I didn't cry but I was feeling a little um, melancholy by the end. It has a pretty happy ending I have to say. This is definitely one I would recommend. And the final thing I read for Booktubeathon was The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. This is his 1976 book about gene-centered evolution. And I listened to the audiobook version of the third edition, which is also the 30th anniversary edition. It contains a couple of new chapters, which are actually from the 1989 edition, I think, as well as a lot of end notes. In this book, Dawkins presents a pretty revolutionary extension of the theory of evolution, um, looking at it from a very different way. He posits that it is gene-centered evolution, that our genes are what drives evolution, rather than at the level of the organism or the group, which is a pretty standard like Darwinian way of looking at evolution. He's saying that that's wrong and it's actually about our genes and our bodies and everything have essentially just developed to carry the genes and help them survive longer. I'm gonna get the negatives out of the way first. This audiobook, the way it's structured and the way it's narrated was very jarring to me uh, because it has old and new material and end notes. It gets structurally complex. Dawkins narrates, I think it's new material and a woman, uh, Lala Ward, narrates the other material and then the end notes are all slotted into the text rather than being at the end of a chapter and I just completely lost track of what the change in narrators was supposed to mean and then I would lose track of the main body of text whenever there was a, a deviation into an end note and it was just really confusing at times and I, and I didn't enjoy listening to it that much. My favorite part of this book is one of the last chapters, one of the new chapters in the book about Prisoner's Dilemma. I'm not going to go into all of that now but you can look it up on Wikipedia. It's a really fascinating idea. Iterated Prisoner's Dilemma and the strategies for uh, dealing with that underlies a lot of understanding about cooperative and uncooperative behavior. And once you know what it is, you see it everywhere. It appears a lot at the macro and micro um, view of, of war and conflict um, and, and relationships. It's what drives evolution in some way. 
is really interesting and I would probably recommend reading this book just for that chapter or finding a book that's just about Prisoner's Dilemma because it's a totally fascinating idea. So that was my book Tubathon. Overall, I think it was quite successful. I wish I'd had more reading time. I wish that I had read an individual book for each challenge, but given how my week went and how busy I was with uh, social stuff and being out of town and, and things like that, I think I did pretty well. I'm glad I just read seven things as it got pretty tough there to reach the deadline, but I did it. So if you've read any of these books, you want to talk about them, as always, please comment down below if you want to. And if you participated in Booktubeathon, let me know how you did, and I will talk to you again soon. Bye.